Everyone, my name is Joey Camacho. I'm a 3D artist and motion designer from Canada. Just want to say a quick thanks to Maxon for having me and a big shout out to everyone on the live stream today. Here are some examples of my personal work. Um, I try to experiment as much as possible in order to develop unique and ownable visuals that um, convey interesting concepts, technologies, product features. Um, since I started creating digital art, I've seen the benefits of daily practice. Um, I've been lucky to work directly with clients, uh, create a large body of personal work and have licensed a lot of it uh, to reputable brands around the world. So that said, I'm also the founding artist of Avant Form, uh, which is a dedicated licensing platform for CGI and digital artists. Uh, it's home to some of the world's leading digital creators, helping them to license their work at scale to clients around the world. So if you're a digital artist looking for you know, a way to make passive revenue while also being part of a pretty rad community of talented artists, you can definitely feel free to apply um, at the link you see here. So for this project, Aveda wanted to showcase a new technology that transformed damaged hair by using a powerful plant-based molecule. This video is 60 seconds of 4K animation that went from concept to completion in just over 30 days. I was responsible for everything from the storyboards to final compositing and edit. The challenge was communicating something very scientific without feeling overly scientific. The piece needed to show technology and tell a story in an exciting way. With a short turnaround, I needed to create something beautiful in an efficient, manageable way. Here are some frames that show key moments, and in this presentation, I'll be breaking down some scenes and techniques created using Cinema 4D and Redshift that brought the whole thing together. Let's check out the final piece. So here's the first scene that we're going to take a look at. Um, this hair animation was a major component throughout the video. Uh, it needed to go from a normal state, damaged, then decoded and strengthened. You can see here that there was a variety of shots that use this setup and I kind of built it out in a flexible way. I just want to take a quick second and give a quick shout out to Noseman who helped me uh, with this method. His tutorials on YouTube and Cineversity are some of the best. Okay, so here we are in Cinema 4D, and I've got this hair, well, actually, this is a hair cuticle, is what it's officially called, and uh, I'm just going to take you through how I kind of set this up step by step. So I've got a displacer set up here, and I've just uh, got a noise shader on it that I've reduced the scale to, and it's set to intensity so that the, um, the effect of the noise only pushes out outwards on the cuticle, um, and so I've got a fall off uh, field here, which is set to linear field. Um, it's a short little field that you'll see. And I've just animated this um, manually to kind of create both a healthy and damaged state, which you can see here. Um, so that field is actually using the displacer to push the cuticle outwards. So I'm just going to create my healthy state here by clicking on uh, the connect objects shortcut that I've docked here. And now I'm going to create uh, a damage state. So I'm just going to move this linear field down a touch. And I'm just going to look up the shortcut here for connect objects. And you'll see it uh, pop up here. So type in connect objects. And now I have a damage state. So you'll see the two states now provide uh, the geometry that I need to blend in my cloner, which you'll see later. So here's kind of what I ended up with. So now that we have these healthy and damaged states, I'm just going to um, show you how I set up the field states, which allow me to drive the texture transition. So we've got two states now of our geo healthy and damaged and the healthy field and damaged field here. And you can see 
that I've got um, two vertex maps, but I'll show you how to do this from scratch here. So I'm going to delete all this. You'll see how I set this up. So we've got our healthy field here, or our healthy state. And in that healthy state, I'm just going to quickly make a vertex selection just using the paint tool. So now I've selected it, you'll see the vertex tag show up here. I'm just going to turn the opacity. Basically, you can just paint if you wanted to, if you want to write in your own map. But we're going to use fields uh, to create this. So I'm just going to apply this. And we're going to click on the Use Fields option. And we're going to jump into the field section. So right away, there's a freeze um, set up, which means that that's where you want to start from. And you know, in here, I've got freeze, I've got linear fields set up to normal. I've got a shader field and a curve field. Um, so we'll just do that. So we'll add a linear field. Now I've got this linear field down from here, but you could create your own. I just, I use this because I already had it set up in the animation. I'm going to add the shader field that I had and the curve effect. Now, if I go into the shader field, the shader field, um, it has a noise set up. I've shrunk it down quite a bit to like 0 0.2, to increase the contrast. Um, I've done a number of things, but anyways, when I get into this, I'm going to set this to overlay because right now it's affecting everything. And I only want it to affect when the linear field goes through. So I set it to overlay. And now you'll see when this linear field comes down, it actually brings the shader and, and breaks it up as well. If I didn't have that, you would just get a flat, um, kind of like basic gradient. And so I'm going to apply that vertex field to the damage state. And now you can see they both kind of match as that linear field moves through. And now I don't want to deal with having to, you know, change one thing if I decide to make an adjustment to a curves in the other. So I'm just going to go into Espresso here, set drivers on the healthy state and set driven on the damage state. And now you'll see that these two states, um, I can actually, I can change things in the healthy state, but, and they automatically show up in the damage state, but I can't do vice versa. So anything that I change here shows up in the other one, which is just saves you a bit of time. So now that we've got our two field states uh, and our vertex maps set up, we're going to put those together into a cloner to create some uh, blended animation states. Okay. So now that we have our healthy and damaged kind of field states, I'm going to bring those together and put them into this cloner. But first, I want to be able to visualize um, my vertex maps in the um, viewport without having to always click on them. So I've created a native Cinema 4D material and an Illuminance channel. I've um, added this vertex map uh, texture by clicking on effects and vertex maps. And I've just dragged in my vertex map here um, because those are both named the same. Uh, they show up in the viewport uh, the same way. And now I can just see what's actually happening without having to click on the vertex maps. So we've got our cloner set up to uh, blend mode um, and we've added this plane effector, which doesn't have any effect going on, but um, it's got a linear field, a white kind of attached to it. And if color mode is set to fields color and um, I've turned modify clone all the way up. And what that does is when the clones are in here, um, and this linear uh, field moves through, you'll see it actually uh, blends the state of the clones. And that's just the geometry right now. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to export uh, five different states of this clone uh, that will create the different blended states of both the geometry and uh, the uh, field state, the vector map state, or sorry, vertex map state. So we just go again, connect objects. We're going to delete the espresso tag that comes over and we're going to turn off uh, the fields that gets brought over uh, from that state. And so I'm going to highlight these. I'm going to move that one down. Okay. Uh, here, let me start over here. So we'll just delete that. We've got our state number one, connect objects hit the vertex map, delete this, and then delete the fields from this. So we don't need the espresso. We're gonna turn that off. We're gonna to move to state number two, export that, delete the espresso. 
vertex map doesn't need fields. And then, so now we'll go to the third state, uh, which is this. And now you can see how it's changed the damage there. We don't have the espresso tag because that's on the second clone. And we've got our state number three there. So now we're going to create state four. Um, so now you can see what state four looks like there. Connect that, turn off fields. You get the idea. So we're just going to create our fifth state here. And once we have that ready, um, turn off fields. Corner. So it's kind of how it all adds up. Um, you'll see the five different states here in a sec. I'm just going to arrange these out into um, uh, just so you can see them side by side using the arrange object. One sec here. Let's pick a good number and apply. And now you can see there's both the five different states of the texture maps so using the vertex maps and the five different um, states of healthy to damaged. And then so in the next step, we're going to take these states and then finally put them into their kind of like final state, their cloned animation. Okay, so we're in the kind of the cloned animation section here. And you can see here's the setup. I'm just going to turn off the cloth and the subdivision and all that stuff. So you can see we're at the same point as where we left off. Um, we got five states damage to healthy and um, you'll start to see that in this cloner object I've got that plain wipe which is just kind of the modify clone state and then I've got a random effector which you'll see how that works in a moment but now I've taken this blend clone done the same thing it's on linear um, I'm just going to show you one instance of that as I turn that on so here's the damage instance um, and there's the healthy state so same as before you know if I was to bring that linear field, it would affect the one, but now I'm going to create a whole bunch and there's five different states. So you see a whole bunch here and you can see the plain white, but now that linear field, um, same setup as before with the modify clone, but I'm just going to like the, you can see the linear field starts way up here, but, um, I'm going to move it down and you can see how as it moves through there, this, you know, the effect goes from zero to 100% based off the size of this linear wipe. And so I can get more or less states. Um, and I know because the animation is pretty quick and I'm going to use a delay effector, um, the linear field was quite narrow here. Um, so I've just added some thickness using a cloth. And then once I turn on the subdivision, it gives you that kind of look that we're, you see in the final animation with this kind of flared um, cuticle. Um, I'm just going to turn this off to kind of watch the preview. But um, yeah, so that kind of gives you a final look. But now I'm going to add this random effector and you can see it. You know, I've added some rotation and just offset a few things in the, the Y axis here. Um, so now we've got kind of our final look, our final assembly. And um, I'm just going to turn this sub D off again and you can see that delay effector gives it this kind of nice ripple effect all the way through. Um, yeah, just, uh, it's a little heavy, but, uh, we'll show you how to kind of get around that in the next section when we export to Alembic. But, you know, um, with the Alembic file, uh, it's interesting. You were able to reverse it and get that set up as well. So right now it's just on a straight linear path. Um, and in the next section, um, after you see it here, we're going to uh, assemble it into a Lembic and get it all ready for kind of like the flexible setups that it needed to be. So now that um, I've got my kind of final setup here with all the clones, you can see it rippling through. Um, we're going to go into and export this as an Alembic. Um, and, you know, I won't go through the process of like exporting Alembic. There's lots of tutorials out there, but I want to show you um, in the final animation, um, the Alembic allows for, you know, um, reversing, you know, wrapping it along splines, um, putting it into other setups. So I've got this helix spline here. I've added a spline wrap and now I can kind of like adjust the shape of this um, this hair setup and you know whether it needs to be more curved or otherwise you can do that but now you see the animation kind of moving through the alembic file here and what's great about this is that you can you can you can export um it without the original delay effector and you can add a delay effector after after so that if you decide let's say to reverse you know like the timing 
of this alembic, the delay will, you know, work in the opposite way. So, you know, if I want to reverse this remap, this time remapping and have the, you know, the cuticles close up versus open up, I can do that. And then the delay effector will still apply, you know, in, in the correct manner. Um, so this allowed me to make quick iterations to, um, the, the textures, you know, if, a if the hair was going from a healthy state to a damaged state or a damaged state to a healthy state. So it was really, really powerful setup. So yeah, there you have it. That's, uh, kind of setting up this cool, you know, cuticle hair animation using, you know, cinema 4d cloners, uh, fields, vertex maps, um, you know, alembic files, uh, and just, yeah, really creating kind of uh, functional, manageable animation setups that can be repurposed uh, throughout multiple shots. Um, and yeah, really was critical in meeting, um, you know, some last minute requests, uh, some animation changes while not having to go back and continuously update um, animation. So uh, cool rig, uh, hope you guys got something out of it and can apply it to uh, your own uh, projects in the future. So now that we kind of had that animation portion done, uh, what I needed to do next was come up with some cool texture animations, um, texture transitions. And these were all based off the idea that, uh, you know, they wanted the hair to look, you know, microscopic, but not grotesque. There was this level of like kind of nod to plants and, and making it feel botanical. Um, so texture transitions were, were really important. You know, there was going to be multiple states again, like a damaged looking state of the hair, healthy coated, and then this kind of strengthened state. Again, these setups needed to be flexible, but, um, you know, wanted to drive both, you know, the textures and geometry for, uh, believability. Um, and here you can see some of the shots where different texture transitions were used, but, um, a lot of them kind of are based off the same, uh, setup. So the principles of this um, can be shown here. Um, basically, I'm going to create some geometry um, and it's going to be pretty high dense, um, high in density. I'm going to create like 75 by 75 segments, um, which will give me more uh, geometry to cre create a believable effect. Um, I'm going to add a displacer and make that a child of the plane object and I'm just going to label this with fields because it's uh, it's going to be affected by fields. Um, a number of those fields uh, will not only affect the displacer, but will also have the fields um, also affect uh, a vertex map and that vertex map will drive texture. So I'm going to make the plane editable. Uh, again, we're going to add a vertex map, uh, vertex weight tag, uh, and we're that's going to give you your free state um, right away. And we're going to set that free state to average. Um, I'm going to put in one centimeter here and 75% here. And you want to make sure auto update is on so that uh, it updates um, as you're playing back uh, in the viewport. So right now we've got our free state, which tells us that's where we want to start from. Um, and we're going to create a, a spherical field. And this is going to act as the trigger to our animation. So we're just going to put this down to like half a centimeter. Uh, just going to drag it up here and we're going to animate it just a couple keyframes. It's going to start away from it and then it's going to be um, uh, intersecting the plane and triggering this vertex map. So um, now that we have the spherical field in here, uh, it's set to max. Um, we're going to just crank up the um, inner offset just so that it's 100% all the time when it goes through, no fall off. And now once we have that set up, um, we're going to add a curve effect and we're just going to crank this up quite a bit. Um, first, let's set it to uh, add and let me just get some more room here. I'm not sure. I'm just going to make some room. There we go. Okay, and then just gonna crank this up. Um, and what that's gonna do is just kind of like, uh, basically push the levels or the contrast of, of this, this state. So now obviously this moves pretty quick um, and for a texture transition probably wouldn't work. So we need um, 
first we're going to put these in a, in a folder, just to kind of stay organized. And this is going to call our kind of our growth effect or whatever. Um, so throw these into a folder. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create like kind of like an offset effect, which is going to fight this growth in a kind of an interesting way. And this is seen in like uh, some other tutorials out there, like reaction diffusion, et cetera. But we, um, we're going to use that as the basis to create our growth effect. So we're going to randomize and subtract that growth, subtract from that growth. So now we're seeing like how it's kind of going off to one side here. Um, you know, the growth is moving away. So we're going to go into that um, random field, which is set to subtract. And we're going to just reduce the scale of it. And now you'll see the randomness is slowing down or the random field is slowing down that initial growth setup. And we're going to add some more to this. So, um, you know, you can play around with the scale of this. Um, you can play around, you know, with the, the seed or a bunch of other um, attributes there. Uh, but we're also going to freeze this state. And then um, we're going to change it to average again, auto update. And this is kind of kind of like create a new paused state. So um, you'll see once I change this to uh, subtract, it kind of doesn't do anything. It kind of like just like chokes up a bit, which is kind of how reaction diffusion works. It's like, you know, it's growing one way and then it's offsetting another way and it's kind of fighting. I mean, it never kind of wants to intersect with itself. So um, we're going to set it the same way up here. Uh, this curve is going to crank up and now we're starting to see that familiar uh, reaction diffusion type setup which is interesting, but it's not exactly what we're going for. So I'm just going to make some small adjustments here. And uh, finally, we're going to go and we're going to add a decay effect. And this is going to kind of smoothen things out a bit. Um, we're going to set this to, um, oh, sorry, we got to set the curve to overlay. Um, we're going to set the decay to um, max, I think. No, we're just gonna leave it normal for now. Um, anyways, uh, we're gonna crank this up to 100%. And then, you know, nothing dramatic here, but uh, I just need to make some adjustments. So one of the major things, um, again, uh, first day organized, but one of the major things we need to do is kind of like, let more of the growth rate through. Um, see, there's none, full effect. and. Then there's there's with and without our kind of what we call as our slower uh, group, which slows down the animation. So now that we um, have this kind of setup, I'm just going to go into this freeze effect and make some adjustments. So I'm going to reduce the effect strength to 50 percent um, and then uh, change the radius a little bit here to kind of see if if it affects now that once you click subfields only, that will change uh, the rate of growth, which means it's only affecting the fields um, below it uh, or the fields within it, I guess. And now you'll start to see as we change the effect and we change the radius, the growth rate will slow, get fast or slow down or get faster depending on um, some of the changes that we make. So a lot of this for me was experimentation. I, you know, I don't really know the values too, too much. I just kind of tinker until I find something that uh, I like. I change the rate of the random field, uh, change the rate of the freeze, you know, you can adjust the curves. Um, so there's a lot of things in here, um, which will affect the overall look and the overall transition. But, um, once I've created something that I like, uh, I can then go in and, and, uh, kind of tweak and adjust it as, as, as I, uh, deem necessary, I guess. So I kind of like that. I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to go into the next step, which is now transferring, uh, that vertex map information over into our displacer. And so we've got, I'm just going to set it up so that this kind of, uh, this plane looks a little more interesting. We're going to add some noise to it and you're going to see how this, uh, vertex map information can then, smooth in or wrinkle out whatever geometry uh, you're working with. So right now it's just the texture information that's moving across this, this uh, plane. But you can see there's kind of some irregularities in it and we want those irregularities to be smooth as this transition occurs. So I'm going to go into the displace, displacer um, object and I'm going to pick something that looks a little bit more interesting. 
uh, with the noise. I'm going to change the, reduce the overall amount here. And um, yeah, just let me find something that looks a little cooler. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, now I'm going to go into um, our uh, vertex map and you'll see here, once I carry this vertex information over into the fall off uh, tab, let's pull in this vertex weight map. And now you see there's something happened. And now our yellow area is displaced, a red area is not displaced. And you can see the effect of the growth, which is kind of the inverse of what we want happening. But you can see here now, not only the texture can change, but the actual geometry is changing. So um, what we want is the actual opposite. So I'm just going to go into this uh, vertex um, fields or fall off area and add an invert um, node. And now red is displaced, uh, yellow is smooth. And that's exactly what we want. Um, now I'm also gonna, just for effect, add a delay effector. I didn't really use this. I use it in some areas, um, mainly when the iridescent uh, liquid hits the, uh, the surface of the close-up um, kind of damaged hair. But I'm gonna put this delay effector on spring mode. And now you can see you get a nice little kind of like ripple effect. It's subtle but we can crank this up and now you get this kind of like wavy feeling which is kind of cool you know if you have some kind of liquid transition i think it does uh it's convincing and it uh looks pretty awesome so um yeah that's kind of how you can drive those textures um using vertex weight maps and here's if you want to get crazy with it and crank things up you can see how it really uh does some cool stuff so you can apply this setup to any geometry um, and really like, you know, really do some cool things with it. To kind of show this in theory or in practice, um, I'm just gonna set up a quick shader to uh, show the material transitions. Um, and, you know, using the fields, the material, um, create a redshift material basically, and just kind of, you know, I'm gonna name this kind of damaged, um, and then we're going to duplicate that and name this one healthy. And I'm uh, going to just for ease of visibility, make my damage node red, my healthy node green. And I'm going to add a material blender. And once we add that material blender, I'm going to put the damaged in the base color. And I'm going to add the healthy node to the layer color one. So now we've got these being split 50 50. Uh, I'm going to make the actual damaged material red, make it rough. And we're going to make the healthy material green and maybe make it a bit glossy. Uh, Okay, anyways, we're going to just uh, then bring in our vertex, redshift vertex uh, attribute node. And this reads the actual vertex weights from the vertex map. So we're just gonna bring in our transition node into the attribute area. So just drag your uh, vertex map, which you can see it says vertex. We'll change it to transition just so we know we're using the right tag. Bring it in there and now um, we'll be able to see it in action. So we're going to use this vertex attribute to then drive the difference between the, the, the blend weight here. So um, I like to create a ramp node just for ease if I wanted to kind of like invert it or, you know, um, sharpen it up a bit to create more contrast. Um, I can show you what the regular vertex uh, weight looks like in the Redshift render view here. Um, and then you can plug it into this ramp node and you can actually like tighten it up or, you know, sharpen it up the other way or degrade it, basically erode it, I guess is a better word. <laughs> so I'm gonna use this and plug it into the blend color one, which is just gonna tell uh, the material blender to use these black and white values to show the difference in materials. So now you can see this green, I'm not sure if it's a healthy green, but it's a green nonetheless. Maybe I'll change that. Um, make it a little, well, now it looks like puke green. Um, anyways, so you can see the transition. We've got this glossy, uh, green 
map and we've got this kind of like unhealthy damaged red map which is a little bit more rough so you can use this vertex attribute node in combination with weights or noises to then you know create different um, variations not just in the the actual transition itself but you can use it to drive roughness uh, maps you can use it to drive um uh, you know glossy maps subsurface maps you can change the black and white values um, and remap them to uh, affect different attributes in each you know different nodes throughout the entire um, redshift shader graph so it doesn't just have to be materials it can be um, all sorts of attributes so uh, that hopefully gives you some level overview here i'm just um, going to add some displacement and just show you kind of you know um, not displacement, but I add some um, subdivisions to smoothen out the actual geometry so we don't have those janky edges. But yeah, super, super powerful technique, you know, nothing too crazy, but I think the importance is actually using it um, to drive things besides just materials. So an example of that here is kind of the final shader graph that I use for um, kind of the iridescent layer. And you can see I'm using the, the vertex um, attribute node here. Um, which has, you know, a similar setup. Um, but I'm plugged into my ramp node. I've got a color invert here, which is saying, you know, it just allows flexibility on whatever I need it to do. Um, but in order to create this map, I actually added a noise texture and mix that with the vertex map. So you can see the edges of the vertex map have a little bit more breakup, a little bit more organic kind of feel to them. So, yeah, and then you can bring this up into, let's say, um, a bump map and remap the the range of the bump and say okay i want my new max range to be whatever this vertex is driving so it's just saying like the black areas have no bump and the white areas can keep their bump and that can be in the same material um or different materials um it can also you could also remap that to uh like say like glossy values but yeah ultimately you can like see even right here i just like use the same thing to drive like glossy values in the damaged state you know it doesn't always have to be a transition you know you can see the iridescent state here um and then together you know i've made this kind of like puddle look right because the iridescent not only is a different material but it's lifted up a little higher using the displacement map as well so that's a look at kind of my shader graph for the final hair material from iridescent to, or sorry, for damage to iridescent and coated. Um, I hope there's something you learn there and uh, it's a technique you can use uh, in some of your other workflows. So next up um, is the botanical particle, uh, kind of this explosive um, particle simulation based around the ingredients uh, that were in the, um, in the kind of botanical molecule per se um the ingredients you know such as like corn sugar avocado green tea coconut there was all these kind of natural ingredients packed together in this um organic molecule and it was to kind of explode and release you know th these these different colors um kind of indicating the ingredients and each one of those ingredients affected uh the hair in a different manner where it was coating protective nature or whatnot a lot of the shots in this scene use particles, many of which, you know, used X particles, some use dynamics, cloners, um, ultimately because of the nature of simulations and the complexity, I wanted to keep things pretty flexible. So, you know, creating this massive explosion and multiple shots, um, I made sure that uh, I set it up in a way that uh, I could repurpose it. So let's take a look at how I did that. So here's a look at uh, kind of the setup. This is uh, you know a similar simulation that I did for the project. Um, we're going to start from scratch, but you can see kind of uh, what this tree looks like. So um, let's turn all this off so we can start fresh. I'm going to go up here and create an X particle system, which will kind of give us our hierarchy. And we're going to create uh, an emitter object. This is going to be our source emitter, which is going to be advecting the particles. Uh, we're going to set it to sphere, knock this down to eight centimeters or so. Um, and then uh, we're going to create, actually, we're going to change this to uh, shot mode. We're going to shoot maybe about one burst of 50 uh, particles. And right now you can't see much in the viewport, I don't think. Yeah, you can't really see anything. So I'm uh, going to change... Um, the display to squares here. Just 
maybe make them white and kind of see them. I'm just going to bump them up to maybe 200% here. So you can just, just uh, so make sure we can see everything. Okay, so I'm going to turn the speed down a bit. There you go. You can see our kind of little uh, advecting particles. Now we're going to set up the particles that we want to be advected. These are the part of the small kind of dust particles. Um, so in order to do that, um, I'm going to, again, change this to shot. Um, we're going to turn the speed down to zero. And I actually want these to be advected on the surface of a sphere. Um, I want that to be, you know, kind of affected in a way I'm doing this so that I can actually like create, use a texture to advect these particles in, in a, in a kind of a more organic manner. So, uh, changes sphere down to an icosahedron. Um, I do that just maybe for a more even distribution. I don't think it really matters. I'm going to actually make this out of display tag and make this see through. Um, we're going to put it on lines. And I'm just going to make it uh, x-ray so you can see through it. Perfect. And I can see my inner emitter and my outer emitter. Now I'm going to emit my advected particles onto that sphere by going into the object tab and adding the sphere as the emitted or emit an emitting source, emitter source. Now I'm going to add a texture um, by selecting texture. I'm going to drop down and select a noise. And in that noise, I'm going to crank up the contrast and lower the brightness and uh, change the scale, maybe like 150. And now you can see, oh, I don't know if you can see that because those are also dots, um, but we are going to be adding these to groups. So I might change this display later. So let me just set up basically our three other parts. So we are green, yellow, and white. And so this is our white particles. I'm just, you know, staying organized, keeping everything visual in the object manager. And this is our yellow particles. And now um, each one of these is infecting a bunch of particles on the surface of the sphere using a texture map, which is driven by the noise shader. Um, now I'm going to create three different groups. Um, first off, this is going to be um, white. And then change that to white. And these are, I'm going to use this. So now the groups take over and the groups I can use to um, create the display mode. And that display mode is also going to be squares. Um, and I'm going to change the speed down to zero because I don't need, these particles don't need to be going anywhere. The actual, they're going to be advected. Um, and I'm going to add that white group into uh, the admitter group. And I need to change, I want to see some variation in the viewport. So I'm going to change the white group to be a ramp. And that ramp is going to be like a light gray to a white. And that's going to be mapped uh, from 0.25 centimeters to let's say, you know, plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. It's going to be auto. So um, just that way we have some variation in the viewport. Now I'm going to duplicate this white group. I'm going to change that to uh, green and then I'm going to change this to yellow. Um, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to add some variation in the viewport. Uh, so I'm going to get like a, like a light warm green or sorry, a dark warm green and a lighter, let's say lighter green, uh, yellow. I'm going to make kind of like a orangey yellow saturated up a bit. And then the bright end, I'm going to make a little bit cooler and then We'll brighten it up a bit. So these are all mapped. Now you can kind of see them all being emitted from the surface. Now you can only see the white ones. Um, and I think that's because I need to add them to the other emitters, the groups, because right now I've got white, green, and yellow. Um, so white, there's my green. I'm going to bring the green group in there. I'm going to bring the yellow group into the yellow emitter uh, the, of the advected particles. And so now the groups are synced up with the actual um, advected particles. Now I'm just trying to, uh, I just want to change the color of these actual icons. Um, excuse me one sec here. So that's definitely showing yellow now, which is great. Um, just give me a moment. And 
it's doing everything I want. But now because of the emitters all being uh, emitting from the exact same source, so they're all emitting um, from, they're all exactly the same emitter. So what I need to do is I need to go in and, and change um, the seed to which the particles are being emitted from. So if you go into the um, advanced tab, uh, well, first off, we can change the noise to which they're each doing. So I'm gonna actually change the noise seed. So I'll go num plus one, which will give each one a unique kind of uh, identifier. And now you can see all three of them, uh, which is great. So they're all being kind of on a different, whatever's white is pushing out those particles. So now the speed, of those particles is just, it looks like an explosion, but it's not really an explosion. Nothing's being evicted. It's just that the particles uh, in these evicted um, emitters uh, need to be changed to zero. So now nothing should go anywhere. And you can see the noise that's wrapped. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I need to make um, that display a little bit bigger. One sec here. Just going to go in here and now um, yeah, there we go. So I'm just gonna bump that up so everyone can see it. So now you can see kind of the noise uh, distributing those particles a little bit more organically. And the next step is to grab an explosion object. And that explosion effects object is what's gonna create kind of our gaseous fluid like state um, for these infected particles to move around. So in our simulation tab, just drop uh, gravity down to zero. We don't want any buoyancy or anything moving anything around. We want these particles kind of float in space. Um, we can leave the vorticity and this, that stuff the way that it is. Um, just gonna go down to uh, sub steps. I'm just gonna change uh, the max pressure to one. And then um, for advection, want to turn that on obviously we want our particles infected um and yeah i think uh that's really i just turn the color up to 100 percent and i think that will start to give us what we're looking for we're not getting any infection yet though because um here let me just make some more adjustments here i think the only thing that needs to change in here is our adaptive uh, size that just allows the adaptive bounds to catch more um, of the of the simulation mm, but we're still not getting the infection and the reason that is is because our emitter source isn't being recognized as something that should be infecting affecting the infection so by adding an explosion fx tag or source tag that'll say okay now recognize the particles that are coming off here as a source uh, to infect those. So you'd think that it would start working, but there's one more gotcha. Um, and the reason you can see kind of the adaptive bounds is there's something going on, not much. Um, and the reason being is, is there's no fuel being added to the fire. Um, and what that means is that um, not only have we not added the explosion modifier into the source tag, so you can kind of see some movement now, um, but once you add the explosion modifier into the tag, you also need to make sure that there's fuel being um, added to that um, source. So you go into general extended data, go into the physical data of that particle uh, emitter and say, look, you need to emit some fuel. And now there's some heat and that heat is what's gonna create the advection. So now you can not only see the explosion in effect, but you can see the heat coming off the white particles and those that heat is pushing the advected particles which are stuck to the surface it's pushing them outwards and creating this advection so now now it's working we turn off the explode the visibility of the explosion modifier and we can see how those white particles or the kind of like the source particles are pushing that and there's our advection so next up, we're just going to actually create the, the particles using Redshift. Um, and to do that, we're going to create, uh, uh, well, let's get cleaned up here. So this sphere, just so we know, is the advected particles source. That's where the advected particles are going on. Um, and in, then we're going to create uh, another particle, a sphere. We're going to call this white particles. 
and that sphere we're going to make we're going to duplicate it make our green particle and our yellow particle and once we have those set up um, we're going to change the size of those obviously to something a lot smaller um, and we can change this later on in the redshift uh, tag but um, we're going to add that tag he here and you'll see because these are attached to XP emitters, uh, a particle tab is visible and we're going to highlight those and actually just want to highlight the white one because we want white to go in white, uh, yellow to go in yellow and green to go in green. So there's our yellow tab. There's our green, yellow. Oh, sorry. Change that and turn this on to custom objects because we want to use custom objects, which are these spheres. So yellow particle, green particle and then our white particle. So now that's all set up. And those particles are now attached to, or sorry, those spheres or instances are attached to the X particles, advected particles. So I'm going into what we had created for our materials. Um, I had just basically used a color, our redshift color user data node uh, selected um, you know, just walk you through that. It's just the color user data node, nothing crazy. And inside of that, I just selected the X particles um, or particle color node. And that, that pulls in the color data that's being used on the particle. So we used kind of random arbitrary. We used a light gray, you know, green to white. So it's pulling in that data. But then what I did is I'm using a, a ramp node to remap it to different colors. Um, so, um, you know, whatever size that particle is it you know based on how big or how little it is it's going to be mapped to um different greens it's going to be mapped to different yellows be mapped to different whites or different shades of white because uh, you can't have different whites so um yeah so now you can see uh here's a green particle i just turned off the other two um and for some reason we get this massive uh blob uh, let me just check to see what I did wrong here. So uh, we got our three particles. I'm going to just reduce the size of these. Okay, that reduces them down. And just going to do some troubleshooting here. So let's turn off our source sphere. We got some pretty big particles there again. I'm going to use the scale mod or the scale multiplier here to in the in the redshift tag to move the, make those even smaller. Okay, well we don't have different objects, so I don't need to pick a different mode that's fine um okay let me just troubleshoot so we've got a green particle and i'm just gonna see why this isn't registering um so yeah i've got it in here i'm going to double check make sure it's attached to the proper object so my materials are attached to the right one this is in here everything seems to be connected I'm guessing, okay. Oh, so for some reason now it's showing up on yellow and the white one. So there we go. So I think it was just a refresh issue. Let me just start the sim over again. Well, let me just make sure that these are also the right size. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna reset everything to make sure we're on the same page here. Okay. So now you can see the green particles and you can see the remapping going on, right? So you've got this, you know, dark green, this really kind of like vibrant green, this mid green. Um, and basically I can just punch in. So those are the colors, um, now that I've attached directly to the color user data node, those are the colors derived right from the, the green group itself. Um, you know, if I got rid of that, now you see bright green. So one's for the visualizer, or sorry, the, the viewport, and the other one is actually the colors you want to go with. So, you know, um, could go in here and you could add another color um, to the ramp and introduce that into the mix of your particles. Really flexible, um, again, just derived off the radius of the original particle. So that however big or small that particle is, it'll it'll map to the, uh, the colors that you have in your redshift ramp. Okay, so now that we have that working, finally, um, just gonna duplicate that into our other particles. Um, Make sure that these are all uh, the correct size, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Um, 
Again, I'm not sure why that's, there we go. So again, refresh, uh, we're good. Now we have the particles emitting the way that we want. Uh, I'm gonna attach the yellow, which is, you know, you can see the color ramp there. And then I'm gonna attach the white um, here. And I'm just gonna, you know, add a little bit of variation. So it's just like a really kind of like light, light gray to white and attach that. And there you go. You can see now kind of the, the baseline of our, um, of our setup. And so, you know, uh, this allows us to like just you know the the noise uh d um, driving the particle emission from the noise texture just kind of creates a little bit more of an organic um approach um an organic simulation basically instead of just everything shooting off um in in the same manner um so yeah i'm going to change the size of the advecting particles and you'll see now the size of them if they're bigger or smaller changes the power of the um, actual simulation. Now, if I change the voxel size of our explosion object, you can also see that that changes the detail. Um, it changes the detail in our simulation. So you can see the simulation runs pretty quick, but there's not a lot of particles doing a lot of things. Um, let me show you how that looks like in here. So I'm going to change the display mode of the explosion object to back. You can see the squares. Um, uh, the squares uh, are that size in purple on the back. So that's kind of the resolution of the sim. I'm going to change that down to two. Now it's pretty dense. And now the particles are like, you know, doing a lot more because they're picking up more resolution and the, and the simulation is more detailed. So I'm reducing the size of the, the advecting particles, um, changing the speed variation of them so that now, you know, you get kind of like this, this more organic um, burst of, or explosion of particles. And so in our kind of like, uh, before we kind of finish this up, I'm going to cash out, you know, a kind of more dense simulation. So once we go into, you know, these groups or sorry, the um, advective particles, I'm going to crank this up to, let's say 10,000 each. So uh, maybe about 30,000 particles, nothing crazy. I think for the end, we did, uh, uh, what was it? I did about 100,000 particles each and then reduce them so they really had that kind of dust powdery type look from afar um i'm going to make some adjustments to the very uh, variation of the advecting particles so some will push out further some will push out less and yeah you can start to see kind of the density picks up here um and you can change random seeds so now like my advecting particles are going to come out in a different pattern and you can play a play around with these um, in order to get kind of the explosion looking, you know, the way you want. You can art direct these a little bit, you know. And so, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's cash these out, I think, soon. I'm going to crank these up. So now we've got 100,000 per. And let's use a cash tag and we'll come back here after I cash this out and we'll see what it looks like. I'm going to click only the same system here so it doesn't cache the other particles in our original setup in the hierarchy. So, all right, so we've got this cached setup. It's looking good. It's pretty dense, it's a little different than the original one, but that's fine. Um, so, I'm going to turn off the explosion objects because it's always uh, running in the background, and now we just run with our sim. So, composite, you can move around, you can take a look at what that looks like. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going to pop open my live view here and see what we look like. Make sure our particles are looking, we're looking a little bit dense, a little bit thick. So I'm going to go into my scale multiplier and reduce that down to about 0.5, maybe a little bit higher. Um, yeah, so 0.75, that's pretty good. Now, in the final piece, what I did on the final shots, we needed, you know, uh, to put together uh, a number of different um, shots showing the individual um, ingredients. So yellow, white, and um, green particles. And what I did is I just ended up creating multiple cameras, trying to find unique uh, shots and repurposing the original sim. Um, and then f would find, you know, an angle that I liked or a shot that I would like. And then I would just go in and, and turn off the other vected particles. And then that let me kind of move around and just deal with one at a time and, you know, frame it up the way that I wanted to. You know, you can add some, you know, some depth of field uh, to get kind of that microscopic look. And it's really, 
it, honestly. Um, it was just about using the tools um, and the integration between Cinema 4D, Redshift, X particles, and finding ways to work efficiently and smart uh, in order to meet some tight deadlines, but still create something beautiful that uh, pushed me outside of my comfort zone. Uh, but I'm really happy with the results. I really hope you guys got something out of this today and just wanted to say thanks again to Maxon for having me. And if anyone has any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me on Instagram at Ron Rendered. And I look forward to the rest of the presentations today. Thanks, guys.